Hello class, Professor Mandeville back. This is lecture number seven for History 102. And uh, first of all, we're now gonna be venturing in to chapter 16 in your textbook, Give Me Liberty. And uh, part of the title of that textbook is the term Gilded Age. So what I want to explain to you first is what's meant by the term uh, Gilded Age. It's a period of American history, first of all, that is basically from uh, the election of 1868 until really the mid-1890s, even though your textbook says it's 1870-1890. Historians uh, define it in different parameters. Now, first of all, it's a term that was coined to explain this uh, period in American history by the famous American author, and I consider him a philosopher, Mark Twain, or Samuel Clemens, his real name. Now, he uh, coined this term, and what shows his brilliance, he wrote essays about him living through this period, the Gilded Age, while it was happening, which shows how brilliant he was. Now, first of all, the term gilded means covered in a thin layer of gold. Now, people out there examining what America was going through uh, in this period from basically the post-Civil War until almost the turn of the 20th century, were, some were saying, this is America's golden age. That all societies have a golden age, and the way that America has prospered and grown in this period, this is as good as it gets. This is our golden age. And they point to things like, some of the things we'll be talking about in the near future, one major event happened in 1869 that was the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad linking New York to San Francisco. A major accomplishment that a lot of people thought we could never do. Uh, industry will grow tremendously during this time period. Uh, before the Civil War, we were number four in the world in industrial capacity. By the time we get into the 1890s, we'll be number one in the world in industrial capacity. No one thought that was possible. Uh, there's going to be brand a brand new term in American uh, society, millionaires. There's going to be wealthy industrialists who will accumulate amounts of money that nobody thought was possible before. The likes of Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller and Cornelius Vanderbilt, gentlemen we'll be talking about in future lectures. So people say this is as good as it gets. Mark Twain said, not so fast. If you scratch the surface of this golden age, you're going to find lead. It's not a golden age. It's a gilded age. It's covered in a thin layer of gold. Now, Gilded items were even popular back in this day and age. Now, I'm going to explain to you why he said that in a minute, but I want to put a little bit into context also. <clears throat> Another term for the Gilded Age worldwide, this was also, especially in Europe, known as the Victorian era. And in the Victorian era, both in Europe and in the United States, Gilded items were very popular. Like you might have a lamp that was covered in a thin layer of gold or gilded. To the naked eye, it looks, wow, that person's got a solid gold lamp. Scratch the surface underneath it, you're going to find a base metal like lead. So, Twain saying this is not the Gilded Age, or excuse me, Golden Age. It's the Gilded Age, and here's why he makes this argument. 
First thing we're going to be talking about, we're going to not go in the same order as your author does in chapter 16. We're going to jump around. <clears throat> we're going to concentrate on the politics of the Gilded Age first. Politics of the Gilded Age was horrendous. As we'll find out, it was dominated by corruption. It was undoubtedly the most corrupt period in American history because there was so much money flying around by the federal government. They're paying for the construction of railroads. They're giving away massive tracts of land in the West, and people are taking advantage of this, and all the politicians basically are on the take. So, politics are extremely corrupt in every shape and form. We'll be talking about this in detail. It's from top to bottom, too. Federal government right down to the state and local level. Now, another area that, uh, you know, people were pointing to, oh, this great industrial uh, growth in America. Ask a factory worker if he's living in the golden age during this time period. Your average factory worker had to work six days a week, 12 hours a day. He'd get Sunday off. And there's absolutely no such thing as overtime. You were paid very little, and you're lucky to be able to put, you know, put it together to make ends meet working that amount of hours in a factory. And they were very dangerous places to work. There were really no accommodations taken for workers' safety. So, yeah, there were millionaires making a lot of money off it. Your average person like you and I were toiling away in these horrible factories and not even being able to make ends meet. Another area, and we'll be concentrating on this uh, a little bit later, cities. Pe this is the time period where American cities really become what we think of today. We're going to have our first city with a million people, New York. By the turn of the century, we'll have five cities with more than a million population. Before the Civil War, we didn't have a single city with the population of a million. All the grand things will rise in cities, like skyscrapers during this time period. The Brooklyn Bridge will be completed. Statue of Liberty will be placed in the harbor in New York. So, people are saying our cities are grand. Look at them. Well, when we cover cities, you're going to find out they're only grand for wealthy people to live in. Average people were packed like sardines into tenement buildings and the cities were filthy, stinky, dirty, rotten places to live for the average inhabitant. There are no glory places like they're trying to say. It's no golden age for your average city dweller. <clears throat> Another area where they said this is as good as it gets, the expansion of the U.S. from coast to coast, forged by the Transcontinental Railroad. Well, yes, we did settle America from the Atlantic to the Pacific. But during the Gilded Age, if you were in the way of this so-called pro progress or uh, this period known as Manifest Destiny, you had better get out of the way or pay the consequences. And the people who paid the consequences were mainly Native Americans. And that was all their land at one point. It was stolen from them. They were rounded up, defeated militarily, had their major food stores robbed from them, the great herds of buffalo, and they were all placed helplessly on reservations in the middle of nowhere. Ask a Native American out west if this was the golden age, and they'd just shake their heads in disgust. So... Mark Twain argued it's the golden age for a select few. Most Americans are being manipulated by this system and are pawns. So that's the uh, period we're going to be studying in detail in America, and we're going to start it out with politics. The first big event to take place politically in this period is the election of 1868. When we left off, we know that uh, Johnson was just sitting in the White House 
counting away the days until he could leave and go back to Tennessee where he came from after his impeachment in 1867. <clears throat> so the election rolls around in 1868 and it's a wide open election, meaning we don't have an incumbent. Johnson's not running. So the Republicans will uh, have a candidate in mind. It's a matter of talking them into it. And the person I'm referring to is General Ulysses S. Grant. Now, Grant was the hero of uh, the Civil War in the North. He's the general that finally figured out the strategy in 1864 of how to defeat the Confederacy. And once he and Sherman take over, they're going to make short work of the Confederates. Now, to give you an idea how popular Grant was, <clears throat> Grant, after the war, the first big event that he attended to honor him, I think I mentioned it in passing, in May of 1865, they're going to have a three-day-long parade in the streets of Washington, D.C. to honor all the Union soldiers. And all of them will march through the parade on a three day, you know, every single man who served that was there is going to march in the streets. It's going to take three days. Giant celebration. And obviously at the end, the last person to march through the streets is the big time hero, General Ulysses S. Grant. <clears throat> at the ceremony at the end of the parade, the citizens of Washington, D.C. will honor Grant. You know, I don't know if, if you're familiar with this uh, ceremony, but in a lot of cities, if you're a, a visiting dignitary and they're celebrating you coming to their city, they'll give you a symbolic key to the city, usually on a plaque or whatever that you can hang in your office, and it's to honor you, more or less saying, uh, we really like you, and we hope you return to our city again in the future and basically you have a key to the city. <clears throat> well, they presented Grant with a key at the end of this ceremony in D.C., but it wasn't a key to the city. It was a key to a brand new house. They had built Grant a house and they gave it to him and basically they said, we really hope you move here to our city and live in Washington. That's how much we love you. Now, later on in the year, there'll be other celebrations. There'll be a big celebration in Philadelphia. And at the end of that celebration, Philadelphia will give Grant a house in their city, trying to lure him to move there. There'll be a big celebration in his hometown of Galena, Illinois. <clears throat> they will also give him the key to a brand new house, trying to lure him to move back to his hometown. So by this point, he's received three new houses for his heroics in the war. Then late in the summer, New York City has a big ticker tape parade for Ulysses S. Grant. At the end of the parade, not to be outdone by these other cities, and they know that it's kind of stupid to give him another house. He already has three. What's he need another house for? They're going to give him a check for $100,000, which back in 1868 would be the equivalent of $1.6 million today. So... They're just showering Grant with gifts. This is the kind of hero he is. This is how popular he is. The Republicans know if we can talk him into being our candidate in 1868, we'll win this election running away. It's going to take some talking to, though. Ulysses S. Grant was a military man, a general. He had never, ever ran for or held a public office in his entire life. So they got to convince him that he can do it because he's basically saying, what the hell do I know about politics? Why do you want me to be president? And they're saying leadership skills, general leadership skills. 
So <clears throat> he agrees, and once he agrees, the uh, Republicans know they got the election in the bag. And political pundits are basically trying to predict how much of a landslide he's going to win by. Now, the Democrats have to find somebody, sort of like a sacrificial lamb, to run as the Democratic candidate uh, for the White House. <coughs> and they're going to convince the former governor of New York State, Horatio Seymour, to be their candidate. He agrees. He knows he doesn't stand a chance, but he's going to run a pretty decent campaign. Now, as we talked about before when we were talking about the Ku Klux Klan, this election is going to be much closer than anyone imagined. In the end run, Grant will receive approximately 3 million votes. Seymour will receive 2.7 million. It's not the runaway landslide everyone had predicted. And we know the reason why. The devious deeds of the Klan and their wave of terror in the South scared black people away from the polls and they didn't vote. If they would have voted, they would have obviously voted for the great liberator, Ulysses S. Grant. So this is why the government had to take action and pass those force acts that we studied earlier because the Ku Klux Klan was capable of manipulating an entire national election if they wouldn't have been put in check by the government. So, Grant is elected president uh, in 1868. He'll take office in uh, uh, 1869. And one thing that's going to really unfortunately put a black mark on Grant's uh, stay in the White House and uh, his, uh, you know, we'll be talking about Grant, but when people think of President Grant, uh, they think of corruption. Because there's going to be corrupt scandal after scandal that racks the Grant administration and takes focus away from some of the great things he did, like make sure the four sacks were passed, dismantle the Ku Klux Klan, carry on with Reconstruction, make sure the 15th Amendment is passed, do many great things for the emancipated slaves. Grant was a tremendous president, but a lot of it was distracted away by these corrupt scandals. And one thing I want to uh, make clear right off the bat, there's going to be many scandals that come very close to President Grant, but none ever are proven to involve him directly. Some people think he's just tricky and he's, uh, you know, crafty and whatnot. Others, like myself, I don't think he was corrupt at all. Here's my theory on President Grant. President Grant was a general. He was used to being able to bark out orders and have them filled the way he said to do it. No ifs, ands, or buts. He gives an order. It's fulfilled by an underling in the military. He ran the White House the same way. He ordered his cabinet officials to pursue certain policy. He figured that's what they're going to do. He also trusted old friends from the military and his family, which will come back to haunt him, unfortunately. So... The first big scandal that I want to talk about is when <clears throat> two individuals in 1869 uh, attempt to corner the gold market. Now, if you're going to corner a market, as it's known, it means you're going to buy up the overwhelming majority of that market, in this case, gold, and then you'll be able to dictate the price. Now, no one had ever attempted to corner the gold market because there was one big obstacle standing in the way. That obstacle was the United States government. 
back in this day and age, and we're not going to get into the details of it. It's too complicated. And if you take economics, you'll study this, no doubt, at one point. We backed all of our money with gold. And we had this giant uh, stockpile of gold at Fort Knox. So all the paper money that was out in circulation was backed with real gold. <clears throat> so if anybody ever tried to corner the gold market, buy up what gold was out there in circulation, the federal government could step in sell gold from the gold reserve at Fort Knox to bring the price down because that would cause horrible inflation. Then once the price went uh, back down, they could buy the gold back and replenish the gold reserve. So no one ever really tried to corner the gold market until two characters, Jubilee Jim Fisk, as he was known, and Jay Gould, two high financiers, attempt to take their fortune and corner the gold market. Now, the reason why they thought they could do it is because they indirectly had the ear of the president. They knew President Grant's uh, brother-in-law, who had married Grant's sister, a man by the name of Abel Rathbone Corbin. Corbin was a Wall Street guy. He married Grant's sister. He became pretty close with Grant. In fact, uh, Grant's sister, Virginia, and Corbin used to visit the White House regularly on Sundays to have dinner with President Grant and his wife. So, they are going to name they, being Fisk and Gould, are going to pay uh, Abel Rathbone Corbin a bribe of $25,000. Now remember, uh, in 1868, when you give somebody $25,000, that's the equivalent of about $400,000 today. So, uh, they gave him $25,000 to fill the president's ear with disinformation. Because they're going to step out and slowly but surely start buying up all the gold in the gold market. But their, uh, you know, their plant in the White House, Grant's brother-in-law is going to tell the president it's nothing to worry about. It's a natural thing. Don't release any gold from the gold reserve. Everything will be fine. So that's his job to earn his $25,000. So Fisk and Gold go on their little scheme and start buying up gold slowly but surely. The price slowly but surely rises. It starts to alarm some of the cabinet members like Secretary of Treasury and Secretary of Commerce. They start having meetings with Grant, telling him he needs to consider selling gold from the gold reserve to bring the price back down. But he's been hearing at Sunday dinners, no need to worry, this is a natural thing. Don't even spend your time thinking about it. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Grant trusts his brother-in-law, Abel Rathbone Corbin. So, Fisk and Gould get very, very close to buying up the overwhelming majority of the gold where they could dictate the price and make a fortune on it when they sold off. And that's when finally cabinet officials met with Grant and said, hey, this is a potential crisis. You could create a post-war depression. Inflation is starting to be a big issue. You must sell gold immediately from the gold reserve. Finally, Grant listened to his cabinet, ignored his brother-in-law, and uh, sold a bunch of gold from the gold reserve, which crashed Fisk and Gould's market. <clears throat> they lost everything, and the country was saved. Later on, it'll be discovered that they had paid Abel Rathbone Corbin this bribe, and a big investigation will ensue. People are wondering, why did it take Grant so long to release gold? 
the investigation, uh, you know, Corbin will testify and say, I was, you know, just duping my brother-in-law. He trusted me. He had nothing to do with it. So Grant is cleared of any sort of uh, being in on this conspiracy to corner the gold market. And obviously the results didn't turn out. Uh, their plot crashed. So that's the very first corrupt thing to hit the Grant administration. So that's where I'm going to call her quits right now. Uh, I'm kind of losing my voice. I'll take a break. If I feel like I got one more lecture in me, I'll come back. If not, I'll be back another day to talk to you about politics in the Gilded Age. So everybody be safe, wear your mask, social distance, and we'll get through this thing. New York's doing just fine, but we are the reason why. So take care. Talk to you soon.